All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, this is our fourth webinar of 2022 as part of our Patient Ambassador Program. Um, this webinar is all about supporting heart transplant candidates, recipients, as well as uh, their caregivers. And we will feature uh, three guest speakers today, each with a different relationship to heart transplants. Um, we're hoping to inspire and support heart transplant recipients and candidates um, to encourage them to sort of navigate the process successfully and enjoy life after a heart transplant. Uh, we will be walking through each speaker's journey and getting their advice on difficult and confusing topics related to heart transplant. So again, thank you for joining us. My name is Cece Cunningham. I am the executive director for the Chris Kluge Foundation, uh, and I will be introducing you to today's panelists and moderating this webinar. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank our generous sponsors of this webinar series, Hearts for Us. They make this all possible, so uh, we couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you so much. Um, some housekeeping to start off. If you're new to Zoom webinar, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We will have a brief Q&A at the very end, so we definitely encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A uh, as they come to mind. Um, I would like to introduce our panelists now. First, we have Jen Lentini. At 13 years old, Jennifer was just a healthy child who ended up going into cardiac arrest on an operating table during exploratory surgery for abdominal pain. Jen was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy. And then after this, Jen waited three months and a day for a life-saving heart transplant. On July 6, 1996, her second chance at life came. Jen honors her donor, Matthew, every day. Jen has been blessed with many honors, including citations uh, for work with transplantation and has been privileged to speak to various communities of over a thousand people on the importance of organ donation. Her true love is helping various transplant organizations like ours and also uh, Long Island Trio, Hearts for Us, uh, and many more. She also helped promote heart health with the American Heart Association and blood donation with the New York Blood Center, just to name a few. Jen's motto is live life like each day is your birthday. And I think that's a good motto to follow. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for joining us. Next, we have Sarah Sequeiros. Uh, Sarah is the mother of three heart transplant recipients. Sarah and her husband welcomed twins in November of 2017. And nine weeks later, their two-year-old daughter, Isabel. Isabel was diagnosed with heart failure, restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, six months later. Uh, she was saved by a wonderful family who agreed to organ donation. One of the twins, Jason, suffered his first of three cardio, uh, cardiac arrests, and he underwent emergency pacemaker surgery. His brother, Jackson, was also fitted with, with the pacemaker. They both did well for the next year and a half until June 3rd, 2020, when Jason suffered another cardiac arrest in their kitchen. Jason experienced a 40-minute ventricular fibrillation code, and they didn't think he was going to make it. But four days later, he opened his eyes. He was immediately listed for transplant, as was Jackson. On June 30th, Jason coded again three hours before the transplant surgery, but was revived quickly and taken to the operating room and had his transplant performed. After they got home from the hospital with Jason, it wasn't long before Jackson's health started to deteriorate. Then on September 22nd, just three months after Jason's, Jackson was also saved by a fantastic family who said yes to organ donation. Their family ensures their donors are always honored and remembered daily. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Next up, we have Dr. Akinobu Ito. Dr. Ito completed his residency training at NTT Medical Center in Tokyo and now serves as Surgical Director of Heart Transplantation and Mechanical and Circulatory Support for the Division of Thoracic and Cardiac Surgery at the Brigham and, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Ito's main clinical focus is on ortho, orthotopic heart transplants and mechanical assist device surgery. He also takes care of high-risk, complex aortic and mitral valve surgeries, as well as aortic dis dissection and aneurysms. His clinical and translational research concerns are heart failure and the clinical impact of valvular surgery concomitant with mechanical assist device implantation and reverse remodeling in mechanically unloaded conditions. I hope I got all that right. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Ito. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have our fourth guest speaker. Uh, our fourth guest speaker uh, was supposed to be Dr. Alan Greg Gregosian, 
Um, unfortunately, she uh, just became ill and had to uh, drop out of this webinar as our featured speaker for today. But just to give a brief introduction on her, Dr. Alan Gergossian is currently a clinical fellow in critical care medicine at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. She was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy on January 15th, 2019, uh, 11 days after Alan was placed on the transplant wait, wait list. Uh, she received her heart transplant. Since then, she has been using her unique voice as a patient doctor to advocate for the importance of organ donation. So we're sorry she can't be here uh, with us today, but we are thankful for her involvement in the organ donation and transplant community. So um, you are very much missed, Dr. Gogosian. Um, and just to reiterate, my name is Cece Cunningham. I am the executive director of the Chris Kluge Foundation. Um, we are a small nonprofit, but a national nonprofit um, based here in Aspen, Colorado. Um, we were founded in October October 2003 by Olympic bronze medalist and liver transplant recipient Chris Klug. Um, our whole foundation is about promoting life-saving organ, eye, and tissue donation, as well as improving the quality of life for those touched by organ donation. Um, we use the stories of transplant recipients, uh, candidates, and other organ donors to inspire uh, others going through the same process alongside, you know, different events, school courses, and webinars to educate those who uh, are thinking about registering to become an organ donor. Um, really, our end goal is to encourage individuals to register as organ donors and to eliminate the wait uh, for life-saving transplant across the United States. So I think with that said, we can jump right into some questions. Um, Though these questions will be directed at specific speakers, this is totally conversational, so uh, we encourage all of our speakers to jump in. Um, first up, Sarah, uh, you know, going through so much with your children and, and in relate, how it relates to heart transplant, when you were told that your daughter had restrictive cardiomyopathy, how did this, you know, change both her life and yours? What were sort of the initial changes and some of the long-term changes that you that you experienced? Hi. Um, well, we were devastated to say the least. Uh, we went from we welcomed twins nine weeks earlier, so we were in a nesting, welcoming twin stage at home, and then she got really sick, and diagnosed with heart failure and everything changed. It became doctor's appointments, labs, echoes, uh, transplant evaluations. Uh, you learn, I learned a lot about hearts and medicines and um, it was just a big change, a big shock and um, um, just um, like I said, we went from newborn twins to this hospital life and having to be pulled away from the babies as well was really hard, but a lot changed for us in that initial diagnosis. Of course, I'm sure. And then to go through with it again, you know, with your twin boys, um, what were some of the thoughts going through your head now that, you know, sort of your whole, all of your children were sort of going through the same experience? Yeah, um, our twins were actually evaluated for restrictive cardiomyopathy at three months and again at five months through echoes, EKGs, labs, and even genetics, but those took a while to come back. Um, so when Jason coded the first time right after his first birthday, it was a complete shock. We thought they were cleared. We thought it wasn't genetic and um, that was really life-changing to go through, seeing your child go through a cardiac arrest so young, well, at any age, really. Um, so having to adapt from one heart transplant to three was, it was devastating, but we did it. Yeah, we just had to get really organized and um, kind of the acceptance of this is our life and this is what it's going to be and trying to stay positive and keeping the kids positive and helping them understand what they're going through as they got a little bit older. And um, now it's pretty much they're used to their new life. They just both had cats yesterday and they did so good. Not one tear when it used to be screams and kicks and fights. So it's definitely it's definitely gotten better, but right at the beginning, it was very, very hard. 
Totally. Yeah. I mean, just thinking about, you know, going through it with children, it's a totally different as a caregiver as well. It's a totally different experience, um, sort of, especially with kids who are young enough, they don't really know what's going on. It's an, a totally different experience being in a hospital for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, it can really, you know, be, be traumatic for kids going through that experience, but also to come out of it, understanding, okay, this was all for the better. This was all for a positive change, I think is yeah. um, super important for them to understand. And it's great that, um, you know, they seem to be, you know, as you mentioned, um, understanding and sort of rolling with the punches and doing really well today. So thank you yeah. for sharing, Sarah. Of course. Yeah. Jason had a lot of PTSD after his first three cardiac arrest at year uh, when he was a year old. And then he had the two more when he was two. So all that trauma, he just, he hated the hospital. So to see him yesterday go in there, high-fiving the doctors and the nurses, and he's like, I'm getting my cath, I'm getting my cath. <laughs> so it was, it was really nice. And, and finally things are getting a little more normal for them and well, our normal at least. But. <laughs> yeah. It just becomes a part of their life. And um, mm-hmm. that's great. That's, that's, and they're, really proud. they're proud of their special hearts and mm-hmm. they're getting braver. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, thank you for sharing Sarah. Um, Jen, I wanted to sort of switch it over to, uh, you know, we were just talking about pediatric heart transplant. Um, you know, could you tell us about your experience receiving uh, your heart transplant and going through the transplant process? Sure. And I can really piggyback on a lot of what you were saying, especially now that I'm a little older and I'm at a different stage in my life. I want to first say thank you for having me. But really, my journey with transplantation began when I was 13. So I was a typical teenager. The biggest problems that I had in life were what I was going to wear to school or I was thinking about boys. Honestly, I wasn't the most studious. As you could see, I'm not really bringing up schoolwork. My younger brother was born with a hole in his heart. So that's really all the knowledge that I had of any type of heart ailments. He had open heart surgery when he was two and I had my tonsils out when I was 12. So that was pretty much my medical knowledge of any sorts. I was a competitive baton twirler. I played lacrosse, softball, better at some sports than others, but really just a typical teenage girl. And I got sick very quickly. I was able to have my birthday March 4th of 1996. And then I started presenting with stomach pains. And for me, it was very hard because I knew I didn't feel good. My parents knew I didn't feel good. But being 13, the doctors and even the nurses at my school, nobody could really find anything physically wrong with me. So it was a really weird time because you're a teenager in general. I didn't feel well. And finally, for after about a month or so, I went back to my pediatrician, a different doctor. And that's when they told my parents that they wanted to do exploratory surgery in my abdominal region. And at that point, they still weren't sure if that was what was wrong. So they said, we're going to do that and let's just see what's figuring out. But they thought worst case scenario would have been that my ovaries were twisted where I couldn't have children when I grew up, which is hard to hear for a parent being a woman or a girl at that time. But they just wanted me to be okay. And as I went in for the surgery, I ended up going into cardiac arrest on the table. And I come from the smallest Irish Italian family that you could think of. My grandparents have passed away and I don't really have, I have one uncle and an aunt. So they had sent my parents home to be with my younger brother. And they're calling them two hours later saying, your daughter's dying of heart failure. You need to come say goodbye now. And they actually had a family friend who was a priest giving my last rites. And really they had my younger brother and my family was saying goodbye to the little girl. And then all I really remember from that point on was that I ended up getting hospitalized from a hospital in Long Island to Columbia Presbyterian. And I woke up surrounded by all these doctors and they told me I needed a heart transplant. Not knowing exactly what that was, I said, sure, sign me up. I thought it was like heart surgery. That's where my thinking was at 13. Not realizing they stick a Proviac tube in your chest, which is a permanent IV that you have to have 24 hours, seven days a week to have medication going to you because I couldn't walk two feet without getting out of breath. And really when I think back to my life, during the transplant process, waiting for everything, I'm actually privileged in a way because I was young enough to not fully knew what was going on, but old enough to kind of know. And then try to make your stay as normal as possible. You go to school when you feel good in the hospital. I was part of child life, which was a lifesaver, but it's very hard because you're looking at, knock on wood, I'll have my transplant 26 years, July 6th. Back then it was a very different world. 
parents were scared to have kids come see me because they didn't know if I was contagious. They didn't want to have their children be around someone that might pass away. It was a very lonely time. I'm very fortunate that I had my family was always there. Somebody was always with me. And pretty much for me that the days turned into weeks, the weeks turned into months. And on July 6, 1996, I truly got the best gift you could get, the gift of life. And they had told my parents back then they didn't think I'd make it to my 18th birthday, my 25th birthday, my 30th birthday, and I just turned 39. So every day you're alive, really, in essence, new medications are coming out, new things are happening. But it was it was a hard balance back then because after my transplant, I was the first one in the Hicksville district to have a transplant. They didn't know what to do with me. I was too healthy to live in fully sick world, but I was too sick to live in healthy world. Well, on prendazone and your face blows up. People used to want to come and pinch my cheeks. And it was hard for my family because I would be so sad that they'd buy me stuff. And then I would buy me stuff to eat. So then I gained more weight. And then I was upset about that. And nobody really knew what to do. And they stuck me on Prozac when I was 13. And it was just a very hard time, I think, going through that as a teenager. So I, I'm fortunate that I am here today. And I really had such good people around me. And that's why I speak because it's not just to honor my donor, which I really do every day and to really remember his memory, but to let people know that transplant can happen to anybody. As we were saying before, you can be a child, you could be 13 and be healthy. And it's really just spreading that word because I hope that one day there is no wait list either. Everybody should have a fighting chance to get a second chance at life, a third chance if they need it. Nobody should have to worry about waiting on top of that because nobody asks to get sick. And I'm very happy that I'm able to, as I said, speak and even going through those crazy teenage years, having the transplant and be on the other side. And it's a roller coaster, honestly, for me personally, and I know many recipients, it's you live like a roller coaster. You have highs, you have lows. Even today, you know, today they see me when we were doing a practice webinar, I had uh, my hat on because, you know, for me, one of the side effects was I lost my hair. So I wear wigs and I'm bald and now I'm a little prouder, but I'm still not ready to fully walk around that way because I have this baby face. So I, I don't look like to walk around, but it really is just the gift of life. Definitely. And going through it as, you know, the teen years for anybody, a healthy individual is hard uh, to navigate socially, emotionally, you know, what have you, but then to go, to go through that uh, with it, you know, this life or death situation, sort of you're hanging in the balance and trying to, you know, you get the transplant and you come back and you're like, all right, time to resume my life as, you know, a normal teen, but you know, it's such a fragile time. And it's, um, it's definitely just to hear your perspective. It's, I can imagine, you know, how lonely it is being in the hospital with different doctors, um, but to have your family and to have that support, support system, whether it's your family or not, um, it's, it's just so important, especially as a younger um, recipient, you know, it's, I think it's crucial. So thank you for sharing, Jen. Um, uh, that was really insightful. And um, I teared up a little bit, I have to say. <laughs> Um, well, kind of shifting gears here from the recipient side to the doctor surgeon side, Dr. Ito, um, would you encourage heart transplant recipients to, you know, pursue an active lifestyle post transplant? You know, is that sort of something that, um, I can assume it's a question that comes up quite a bit, um, you know, as a, as somebody who works with heart transplant recipients all the time, um, What's sort of your take on pursuing an active lifestyle post-transplant, especially, you know, with a new heart? Um, thank you for the question. The great thing about heart transplant is that, you know, as long as the, the new heart works normally, then you can have a really active lifestyle. Probably Jen and Sarah can talk about this much more, much better than I do. But, uh, you know, a couple of my patients are, are running 5K, 10K, 10K after uh, a heart transplant, so even like, you know, three months after the surgery. So uh, so those things are definitely possible. Um, then, you know, go for swimming. So compared to uh, ventricular assist device, actually, I have, I also implant those things in, back in my uh, desk. You know, I have all those devices. Uh, but uh, those things are also, you know, heart support we implant to patients who are not, uh, qualified for heart transplant or they're too sick to go for heart transplants or, you know, we don't really have enough, I mean, like, we don't have heart available quickly enough to 
to transplant or older patients, you know, over 65 year, year old of age. Um, so those patients who get this mechanical assist device, you know, they cannot uh, go for swimming or, you know, uh, running, uh, they, they, go, they go golf and running and things, but uh, the things are so limited. So, so from that perspective, I think heart transplants are, are uh, really uh, beneficial for all of our patients if, they're, if they can get. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I had a hard time to accept this situation, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic. I lost a couple of my post heart transplant patients, uh, although they were vaccinated and they're very careful about infection and all those things, but, uh, but uh, they, they uh, suffered from uh, COVID-19 and a couple of them actually uh, passed away because of that infection. So as it, as it tells us, you know, the uh, transplant patients are vulnerable, susceptible to any kinds of infection, as you know, because they have to take uh, immunosuppressive medications not to reject the heart by your immune system. So you have to knock down your own immune system. So those are the medications always our heart transplant recipients have to have, then that'll make yourself much weaker to, against all the infections. Therefore, you know, they, they, despite the vaccination, they, they unfortunately, you know, get really sick uh, with the COVID and any other stuff, you know. So uh, important to take uh, immunosuppressive medications. At the same time, you know, you make yourself a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, susceptible to all the infections. So, so that's uh, the definitely the downside. Also, Jim mentioned the steroid take and the other medications, and you know, so so it's not uh, risk free or you know everybody's happy with the heart transplant. There are downside of that. However, as we discussed, you know, the, the lifestyle can be very, very active and many patients do, you know, live their normal life. Um, so it's, it's a really good uh, uh, treatment uh, we surgeons and the physicians can provide to our patients. Definitely. And you mentioned, you know, the effects of COVID-19 in the last two years. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, obviously lung transplants have sort of increased with COVID-19, but also um, we've seen a lot of a, a big increase in heart transplants as well as it pertains to COVID-19. And not to veer off the subject of, you know, pursuing this active lifestyle, um, I think you put, you know, it, el it eloquently. Um, but if you if you wouldn't mind sort of discussing sort of this increase, the reason behind this increase in need for heart transplants, uh, especially throughout COVID-19 and sort of um, how heart transplant recipients are at risk or if that differs, uh, if that risk sort of differs from, you know, a normal or normal, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, somebody who is a transplant recipient of a different organ, um, how that sort of varies from uh, heart transplant recipients. Uh, heart and lungs, they both are, uh, it's been very difficult time for us over the last two, three, two, three years. Yes, especially lung transplants, you know, uh, those lungs can be, uh, you know, affected by the COVID-19. We, we do have many organ donor offers, you know, who are COVID positive now, even like kidneys and liver and all those things, so, you know, donors can be, can carry COVID-19. So it's been a very, it's been a hot topic in our field, you know, whether we take those hearts and lungs and, and any other organs, you know, from COVID positive patients. And uh, we do actually, yeah. So then the, that actually predisposes our patient recipients to be, you know, uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, which, you know, we also, you know, immunosuppress those patients, recipients immediately. Uh, therefore, there is a huge uh, inherited risk there. Um, so it's that that has been our challenge. Initially, you know, when, when we went into pandemic, our transplant, you know, all the activities shut down. As you can imagine, you know, same as all restaurants and shops and all those things. Uh, but the things bumped up uh, really well. Um, so then especially for those lung transplant patients who uh, get, get a COVID-19 and their lungs get really uh, devastated, that's also very difficult because they carry some sort of you know, COVID-19 infection. And then again, we have to immunosuppress those patients. And then, then we take the lungs out and put a new lungs in. You know, that is a very challenging uh, treatment for us. So uh, that's... Uh, uh, it's been a quite different time, you know, in, even in my career uh, over the last 20 plus years, you know, it, it's, it's been very difficult. 
I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, especially in the beginning, you know, when uh, transplants, I think uh, nationwide were deemed sort of like an elective surgery. And that's, I think, the reason behind um, why it was, uh, you know, halted at the time. Um, and then it became this increasing need that um, is still obviously uh, present today. So thank you for sharing, Dr. Dr. Ito. Uh, my final question, I will say just uh, back to the active lifestyle um, for heart transplant recipients. Um, you sort of mentioned it in your your initial answer, but are there any precautions that you would urge uh, heart transplant recipients to take, uh, you know, in regards to pursuing that active lifestyle, to running that half marathon, marathon, 5k, whatever? Um, is there any, are there any precautions that you think are important for um, heart transplant recipients to take away in that regard? I think it's a, a lot of detailed stuff, you know, like when you go for a dental cleaning, you know, you probably want to take some of the you know antibiotics treatment which is you know usually recommended by your uh heart transplant um uh, cardiologist and uh, also any kinds of you know like uh, you uh hit your uh your nails like you know you get some uh bruise and something you know those things can really uh, cause some sort of infection uh at the same time obviously you have to keep taking keep taking immunosuppressive medications and as, as you know, directed by, by physicians. And if you stop taking medications, you know, some patients get, uh, especially during the pandemic, one patient I saw was, you know, due to their, they lost a family or he or she lost a family and then uh, got into a sort of de depressive situation and stopped taking medications. And two weeks later, this, this patient came to us and uh, with, the, with the rejection uh to against this uh new organ gift of life you know so then the heart function was not uh was not uh, sufficient so those situations can happen you know depending on patients each patient situation so so that is something you know as a family or friends you know we can all support these uh, uh recipients you know to be able to keep going with their medications but you know maintaining an active lifestyle you know encourage them to you know do any kinds of activities together um so that's something what we can do uh from our health provider standpoint and the family standpoint Definitely, definitely. Well, thank you for sharing, Dr. Ito. Um, uh, I wanted to, along the same vein, I wanted to um, ask Sarah, you know, how do you intend, speaking of a healthy and active, you know, lifestyle and pursuing that post-transplant, how do you intend to encourage your children to sort of um, go after that, you know, difficult physical goal or to uh, pursue that healthy and active lifestyle, um, you know, regardless of their current medical situations. Yeah, um, our daughter actually is uh, getting really good at rollerblading. She rollerblades about four miles now, almost every day. Uh, and the twins are very active uh, as well when it comes like bicycling, hiking, we do all that kind of stuff. Um, it's been really hard, um, kind of like what the doctor was saying, these past few years, we've been home and hospital only. Both twins were transplanted in June and September of 2020, so right in the middle of COVID. Um, they had just started opening back up transplants when Jason coded. So we, you know, got really lucky there that he was able, they were both able to get listed and receive their hearts. Um, but it's just finding that balance of they're still kids. They need to, you know, they run around, they have good energy now with their new hearts, but they're very aware that they have their special hearts. We've always been completely transparent with them. Um, they'll tell you now, if you offer them food, they'll say, is there pomegranate or grapefruit in it? And they know, you know, they can't have that because of their medications. Um, they wash their hands, you know, after, obviously after bathroom, but before every meal, they, I don't even have to tell them anymore. It's just kind of a second nature to them because they know they're immunocompromised. They can't have germs and They've been really good at accepting all of this, I think, because they were so young when they started. And now they're at the age where they, oh, I understand. Okay. And they did catch a little stomach virus a while back. And since then, they're like, I don't want to get a virus. I don't want viruses. So they're they're very germ aware and uh, very cautious, which is nice now that they're older. But as for the active lifestyle, we we don't give them any limitations. Like I said, Isabel rollerblades four miles now, more than I could, and she's six. 
And the twins, I, I can't keep down if I tried. They're all over, they're swinging and monkey barring and, you know, they're four-year-olds and they have new hearts now. So it's no more tired, heart failure kids. They're very, very active. But yes, we definitely encourage it. They know their hearts beat for two and that, you know, we encourage them to live up to their best potential for themselves, but also their donor because they're their hearts beat for two and they we just let them we remind them of that constantly definitely definitely and it's so great to see that change from you know tired sick to full of energy just like toddlers and you know young children yes. are supposed to be so it our must doctors be- told us it was going to be like putting in a new battery and yes. it was it was <laughs> I bet oh I bet oh that's wonderful thank you for for sharing Sarah um Uh, Speaking of, you know, sort of organ donation advocacy, Jen, you and everyone else on the panel are clearly very strong advocates for organ donation and as well as the transplant community. Um, You sort of mentioned um, advocating for your donor and um, keeping his memory alive. But, you know, just sort of as a general question, or if you want to go into specifics, you're more than welcome. You know, why, what got you started with um, your advocacy in this area? And why did you sort of feel that need to um, start advocating and drawing attention to the transplant community? Well, right after my transplant, I think it was a very just weird time for myself, my family. And as I said, just being a teenager in general, where I actually do have a picture. This is my donor, Matthew, he's in the middle. And he was 14 years old. And I received that picture and a letter from my donor mom about a year after my transplant. I always knew I wanted to speak except for when I was younger. I think I didn't want to deal with the transplant. It was almost as if I got this transplant. Okay, I'm not really sure how to navigate it. I was very fortunate that I have two very polar opposite parents where my mom is like, Let's go zip lining. You want to learn how to fly a plane every year on my rebirthday. I always do an adventure, which this year I'm from New York. I actually have gone to the edge. I don't know if anyone knows it where you could take pictures, but I'm going to be skyscraping pretty much alongside of it this year. So she'd be like, do what you want. Live your normal life. My dad be like, I'm going to put you in a bubble and you're going to sit there. So it was kind of nice because I had both aspects. And even with speaking, my first speaking engagement was after my transplant where I was with Regis Philbin, Joe Torrey, Frank Torrey. My brother loved it because he's a huge Yankee fan. He followed him around with a video camera. Back then it was like old school cameras. And he was mad because he was balding Frank Torrey and Joe Torrey. So they didn't want him following them around. And then they put me in this gala of all these people, I'm going, I'm on Brendan's going, I don't know what's going on with my transplant and you're telling me to speak. So my mom goes up there, thank goodness, at the Crest Hollow Country Club and it's like, if you guys were the Backstreet Boys, she'd be talking. Meanwhile, I am a typical 90s girl fan. I go see them every year. I'm seeing them twice this year. I'm actually going to meet them, I hope, this year. I will pay money. I don't care. Putting it out there. And I'm a big Disney freak. I always say these things because you never know who's going to hear it. But... That's how I started talking. I was pretty much thrown to the walls and they said, share your story. And then the older I got, I started to learn how to really share my story. I started speaking at high schools with Long Island Trio. I've done stuff with, as I said, various organizations. You know, I've been to Hearts for Rust functions in different places. And really that's kind of when I found my passion and I saw that other people were speaking because especially in high schools, I wanted to share it with people that even not just transplantation, but you could have something different about you and to really be kind, which is something my mother taught me. She was a TA for a long time and has changed so many lives, but just to show them that transplant or not, you can have a normal life as what we have, or just to be kind to each other. And now they can't get me to stop speaking. And really, I've realized one of the biggest compliments that I got was from Facebook. I even went to the transplant games a few years ago. I only started my first games were like seven years ago. Because in my mind, I was going, I'm going to go with a bunch of crazy transplant patients like myself. I don't know what's happening. And you're going to stick me with another 10,000 of you? I was like, ain't happening. And I played tennis. And it was funny because actually one of the people that won your award one year, Derek Fitzgerald, he sees me. He goes, oh, you're playing tennis? I'm like, yeah, I got a green racket for organ donation. That was my way that I was going to spread 
the word. And and now for me, it's really just speaking. And as I said, one of the accolades, they said that if I could have won most Facebook friends, I would have won that contest because I just speak to whoever will talk to me. I share my story. And even one year for my rebirthday at On the Border, a student came up to me and this was my 10 year rebirthday. So I had been speaking for a while and she said, I became an organ donor at 21, she became one. And she said, I remember your story from school. And somebody just briefly on Facebook, I was posting about the organizations I'm in and how I speak. He goes, it's not the fact that you speak that I'm proud of. It's that you live your life. And that's really what I want to show people. And that's what I see from people when I'm in my groups and I see someone had a heart 30, 35 years. I'm going, yes, let's all get there. Let's keep going. And as the doctor was saying, and you have transplant recipients as children and whatever the case may be let's get that word out let's show them why it's so important and even with tv that's changed throughout the years to show people what's going on Some is right but at least the words out there so that's what i'm really about just living your life and to me my friends joke i have my rebirth day but we we do donations for long island trio and we do stuff with hearts for us but i have my rebirth day my birthday i'm sure i put in something else so everybody kind of like oh jen's having a birthday for something i'm like yeah i'm the type of girl if i had fine china i'd be eating off it every night because why not every day is special so just live your life that's something i just like to share with people so that's why i speak i speak because my donor matthew i got to meet my donor mom seven years ago because all i ever wanted to do was say thank you and that became something that I could have never even imagined after so long. I was on Reddit. I was on this. I don't even know. People said I look like Drake's kid. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But it's really just about inspiring others. And I hope that me just being me, I tell people, I'm just Jen. <laughs> they call me Gentini. I got my yoga certification. I go to a place named Merge over here and they call me Gentini there. And I just hope that if I could share my story, and you see that I'm living proof and so many others are, that's what it's about. One more donor, one more person's life saved. Definitely. And very well said. <laughs> it's clear you're very passionate about uh, transplant and organ donation and, you know, uh, giving it forward, passing it forward. Um, I think it's, it's really the theme here. And um, thank you so much for sharing, especially about your donor uh, and his, his sort of story. And um, I believe we will be seeing a video at the end of this webinar after our Q&A, um, just sort of a, a video uh, about your donor and sort of um, your relationship with his donor family. So um, yeah, that, that's something to look forward to. So everyone stick around. <laughs> um, I will say uh, Dr. Ito um, sort of uh, shifting gears to, uh, you know, what's to come, you know, what do you see uh, in the future for heart transplants? Um, and are there any sort of new and exciting developments that you've seen uh, in the medical field? That is a very good, timely question. Um, over the last five to 10 years, we had a slow increase of heart donation and heart transplants. And especially over the last few years, we have a new movement to uh, utilize the donor hearts from um, patient, patients going to uh, circulatory arrest. It means that uh, when the heart stops for some reason, we, we get ready for that, you know, so then when the patient's heart stops, then, you know, that's the time we declare, you know, this person's death. And then, then with obviously, you know, this uh, patient or person's uh, uh, living will, we go and open the chest and, and uh, resuscitate the heart. So that's what's called the donation after circulatory death. Uh, compared to the traditionally, it's been quite common. That's the only uh, a patient's uh, donor source we had. It's called the donation after brain death. So it means that, that the body is quite okay. You know, heart's beating, but a brain is completely dead. So obviously there is no function as a human being. So that's another uh, 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 definition of, of death. So, so donor has been limited to uh, patients with the brain death. Uh, but now we're expanding the donor pool to uh, donation after circuitry death so that uh, we can expand the, the untouched uh, donors 
uh, which can be utilized quite a bit. There's a risk to do that because obviously, you know, the heart is arrested and then now we're trying to resuscitate and utilize this. So, uh, so we have a very strict protocols to, uh, to resuscitate the heart and uh, assess the heart function, you know, to be uh, reasonable to be implanted to our recipients. So that's, that is a very exciting um, uh, a movement over the last uh, year. Uh, of 2021, there are about uh, uh, 200 plus uh, heart transplants were done in, in the country. So it's going to be uh, continued and the, most likely it'll be more expanded so that uh, we can increase the, you know, uh, our heart transplant uh, uh, opportunities to all of our recipients. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, uh, at CKF, our motto is to eliminate the weight. And we try to do that by targeting people to register as organ donors and to educate them on the facts of organ donation. But um, on the other side is the medical side, which is advances in technology and medical science. Um, and it's really incredible what you guys do um, and the research that is, especially in the last couple of years with not just COVID, but just with, um, you know, where we are at in 2022. It's really um, exciting to see all these medical developments um, sort of taking place. So thank you for sharing, Dr. Ito. Um, and we're very excited to see what's to come uh, in the future. Um, we appreciate your input. Um, that said, I think we can move into our Q&A. We already have some questions, but again, I definitely encourage all of our attendees, if you have any questions, please don't be shy. Um, submit them in the Q&A box down in your uh, lower panel. I will start with one. The first question we have uh, is directed to Sarah. Um, Sarah, how do you cope with three transplant children and what challenges do you feel are unique for pediatric transplant recipients? It's brought its fair share of challenges from having to learn all the medications they're on. Um, our twins were three months apart in their transplant. So one was on 15 meds, the other one was on 12 when we came home. So having to learn all of that, um, plus, you know, spot checking vitals and just a lot of, a lot of medical challenges in the beginning. Um, then another big challenge was COVID. When COVID hit, our the little outlets that we did have we were cut off and we really didn't get out much in the world. And um, the twins were in heart failure. They didn't want to go out anyways. But after, like nowadays, they're wanting to go out and do things. And it's a little harder for us. The vaccine's not available for the twins because they're still too young. And um, having to them to understand, you know, what's going on with this pandemic and why our daughter had to do virtual learning for kindergarten, which she loved, by the way, <laughs> it ended up being a really good thing for her. Um, those are just a few of the challenges we face. And um, up until yesterday, even doctor's appointments, labs are, we get, they get labs drawn constantly because their tackle levels go up and down the first couple of years. Uh, we got off some new medication, so they were all wonky. And it's like six weeks of weekly labs for three, four-year-olds causes a lot of stress and anxiety in them. So um, yesterday was a really good day for us. And the fact that Jason was so willing and happy at the hospital, um, was definitely nice because that's a big challenge is keeping their anxieties down while my anxieties are through the roof thinking of I'm waiting for their cath results right now you know reject if there's any rejection how their biopsy looked and their pressures and um, it's a constant worry it's a constant mental battle with yourself trying to you know don't worry let it be what's going to happen is going to happen you just take as good a care of them as you can take care of their hearts keep them active hydrated you know um so i think one of the challenges is just mentally making sure that your mental state is okay because if you're not then everything else is going to fall apart yeah, stability starts from sort of um, starts with you. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, um, you know, emotionally and especially with young kids going through this experience um, to be that sort of um, stronghold for them and uh, their, you know, biggest supporter. It's um, certainly very valuable. And I think it's necessary for any anybody going through pediatric transplant, heart transplant or not. So um, thank you for, for uh, answering that. Um, 
Jen, uh, we have one question directed to you. Um, what advice would you give for a teenage transplant recipient and their family to cope with the mental strains, sort of what we were just talking about, to cope with the mental strains of transplant? I do just want to say to Sarah, your children too, later on in life, because I, I realized how important and intricate and what my parents really went through now that I'm 39, not that I didn't realize you when I was younger, but you start to realize it older and, and you really, it takes a village. For me, I always tell that to people. It's, it's the family. You have to be okay. And my mom says the same thing you think her sanity, even to this day, she's pretty much a nurse. She could have been a doctor with knowing all the medication, all that stuff. So really what you do is so important and there will probably be challenges, especially because you're going to be growing with them and going through all those yeah. stages, but <laughs> you're doing a great job and just keep going with it. Thank you, Chen. Thank you. Hearing your story has totally inspired me today, too. Just seeing, you know, living through the teenage years to adulthood, it's just, it's music to my ears hearing how well you're doing. Thank you. If you need anything, I'm always around. But really, I do believe that one thing, if if hospitals and doctors in general could really focus a little more on mental health after transplantation, especially during that time. I don't care how old you are, but especially during those teenage times. And not just for us, but even your family, because you don't realize how it affects siblings, parents, even friends of your family, because you're the patient. So you're the one that's going through it. So it's kind of the, woe is me, why me? I have to do this but they all still have to function as normal people. So I do believe that I, even though, yes, they did try to make me go places and do certain things. I wish there was a little more aspect done with the mental, because I think that you mentally and physically have to be aware and helped out just not one way or the other. Cause if you work with both, it'll help a little more. So I really do hope that doctors also see that when one thing I'm very big on is we're not, we're each different. We could all have the same diagnosis. It'll have transplants, but each patient is unique. So to really look at that and not just look at the overall aspect of a transplant patient, but each of us on a unique level. So I think it's really just going through it and trying to take your medicine. And as a teenager, if you are scared or you need support, go talk to someone, but really know you're not alone. And there are people, and sometimes you could even have older people speak to someone that's a little bit younger or even family members speak. And for me, I didn't want to talk. That was the thing. I didn't want to be in groups and everything. Like when they would sick me in rehab, they like, go to cardiac rehab. Okay, well, back then, 30 years old was old to me. So now I'm 39. I'm like, oh, my God, I shouldn't have been saying this when I was younger. But maybe they could have a little more where it's a peer-on-peer -peer thing because as much as I love doctors and everything like that, you need others to kind of get examples from and speak to and parents need people and siblings need people. So really just overall, I think it needs a village and to keep going and remember there might be bad days and it's not going to be a perfect life, but it's a life and you just got to keep on swimming. Big Disney fan. I, just said. <laughs> I love it. I love the energy and I love, your outlook on, you know, life in general. And I think a lot of it, if, you know, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it really sounds like a lot of it, that inspiration comes from, you know, your experience uh, with heart transplant. So Jen, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm, I'm sure just like Sarah, we've all been sort of inspired by your words and your outlook on life um, going forward uh, post transplant. It's been really a pleasure to have you. Thank you uh, for sharing. <laughs> Um, Dr. Ito, we have a uh, question from an anonymous attendee here. Um, Dr. Ito, sometimes I struggle to understand the technical terms and testing that my doctor uses at times. Um, I believe that pertains to, you know, the heart transplant process. Um, are there any resources I can use to find this out? I haven't gone into the uh, actual Facebook page, but uh, I always find some, you know, forum and discussions on Facebook. So most likely you're going to find probably Jen and Sarah knows, know, they know better than I do. Uh, and also on the website, I do know that there is a, a smartpatients.com. That's actually a hot transplant community. There is a, you can log on and put your email in and you can participate to the conversation. You can ask any of those questions, I believe. 
Um, there are a lot of resources there. Um, I'm very sorry that you, you have a hard time, you know, with your doctors. If you come to Brigham in Boston, then we'll, we'll have a great doctor, so we'll, we'll take care of you for sure. But uh, you're, you can always request your physicians to explain, hey, doc, you know, I understand you're smart, but you know, can you pl- explain to me in a better way that, you know, I, I can understand or, you know, so it's always it's your right to say that. 100%. So they should be able to explain to you that's their failure. You know, they cannot uh, have their patients understand what they're talking about. So, so you know, please do not hesitate to ask your physicians, you know, to explain to you much uh, easier way so that you both understand each other really well. So the treatment goes, goes well. Right. That mutual level of understanding is so important, especially, you know, you never want to be left out in the dust, uh, in the dark. Um, about something so important as, you know, a heart transplant, receiving a new heart. So thank you, um, Dr. Ito. We have another question for you, sort of pertaining to the future of heart transplants. Um, What is your stance on heart transplants using gene-edited pig hearts? And I believe I've seen this in the news um, very recently, and um, the sort of animal-to-human transplants, um, it was sort of a big deal when it first came out. What's what's your, um, what's your take on it? That is a very uh, cutting edge treatment, you know, which was done at the University of Maryland in the er- earlier this year, and the, the recipient uh, survived for about two months or so. Then, you know, moving on in the future, if this is going to be our future treatment, I think it is, it is possible. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of gene therapy we need to do for those um, uh, pig to be able to accommodate, you know, a human body can accommodate pig hearts. There are millions of genes we may have to think about. Now uh, they've modified only 10 genes. So if you think that way, okay, there may be a, a long way to go, but as we started a human heart transplant in 1960s, Initially, those recipients only lived for a day or 10 days or months. So it was a similar situation as we have with the pig heart transplant. So therefore, you know, it's been 50 years since then. And now look at these people, you know, our recipients are, you know, living like 20 years, 30 years, you know, uh, and they have their own life. So, uh, so from that perspective, I think it would be definitely possible in the future. Hopefully, uh, you know, before I retire uh, as a surgeon, I get to do any of those things, you know, to save our patients. It's certainly very exciting. And um, just to see it in the news, any transplant news is um, welcome news. And uh, especially as it pertains to heart transplants, um, it's so crazy to see, you know, how far we've come. transplants, you know, all across the board, not just heart transplants. So it's really uh, an interesting perspective. So thank you for sharing, Dr. Ito. Um, The next question is sort of for the whole panel. Um, It's uh, from an anonymous attendee here. What foods or drinks are restricted for heart transplant recipients, if any? (laughs) Well, grapefruit's a big one. I've actually never tried grapefruit because I didn't eat it beforehand. And I, I do say, though, I'm a little bit of, I guess, a rebel where I always say, I, th- I believe everything in moderation. You know, yes, should we all go eat a whole cake every day? Probably not. But if we have a piece, I think it's okay. You know, I, just like anything else, they say we're supposed to watch a heart healthy diet, but we do have these transplants and stay active. So I think, too, one thing is to listen to your body. And I'm just speaking for me because I'm not a doctor. I do not have a doctor. So I'm just talking from my perspective. But to listen to your body and know that it is about moderation, but you're not supposed to eat raw fish. You're not supposed to eat processed meats. I mean, I could go through the whole list if you want and things have changed, but talk to your doctor is one thing. And sometimes what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander. So kind of go with that. Thank you, Jen. Does anybody have any, any other um, perspectives or an answer to that uh, question? Um, I usually just tell people um, if they're kind of aware of what a pregnancy diet is. All my kids' food should be pasteurized, fully cooked, fully washed, just extra careful. Um, No pomegranate, no grapefruit. Just like Jen was saying, though, our team is kind of like, you know, it's easy now that they're little. You can control what they eat. They listen. But as they grow up, 
they might want to try things and it's, you know, teach them that you can't have it because of these reasons. But like she said, moderation and just being really careful that it's cooked and um, low risk of like listerias or any food borne bacterias is kind of my thing. And of course, like I said, pomegranate, grapefruit, pomegranate, grapefruit, <laughs> they cannot have it. <laughs> it's bad for their liver, everything. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, this is sort of a question for myself, um, related to that, um, alcohol. And I guess Dr. Ito, if you'd like to chime in, chime in, um, for transplant recipients, heart transplant recipients, um, what, uh, is sort of like the consensus on alcoholic beverages? I know, especially with, um, going through your teenage years and then getting older, obviously you're put into these situations where it's kind of a, Oh, there's alcohol where I'm at. There's alcohol. My friends are drinking alcohol, you know, whatever. Um, how is that sort of perceived uh, within the transplant community, but more so in the heart transplant community, um, if anybody would like to chime in? So alcohol is, you know, I have to say that's fine, you know, if you want to have a sip of the wine and things, but uh, there are certain medications, uh, immunosuppressive medications, which can uh, interact with alcohol. So, uh, so that obviously, you know, you have to speak to your physicians and see. There are many, many different uh, immunosuppressive medications, and uh, some of them are okay, some of them are not. So you definitely want to uh, check with your physician to see if that's uh, okay. But overall, you know, uh, 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 cancer risk with the liver and any other things with alcohol in ingestion is, is, is a little bit higher. So if you want to refrain from uh, uh, alcohol, I think that's the best way. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm just now seeing the time and I want to get through this really quickly. Um, we have uh, two more questions. For, uh, one from Jim Gleason. Hi, Jim. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, when Jim says, when I got my heart transplant 28 years ago, post heart transplant life expectancy was an average of nine years. So today, what is it for a typical heart recipient um, receiving you know, their heart? What's sort of the average life expectancy today? Uh, it, there is about 90 plus percent uh, survival one year after heart transplant. And then after that, there is a slow decrease in the, the latest number in adult heart transplant. Pediatric transplants are, are a little bit better than this, but adult heart transplants, 10 years survival is about uh, uh, 60 percent. So obviously 100 patients get transplanted 10 years later, still uh, 60 patients are still alive. Um, then the pediatric patients are uh, much better once they survive the earlier phase. So, you know, then 20, 30 years, um, it's not rare to see those patients. Thank you for sharing. Um, and in the interest of time, I know we have a couple questions that are going to go unanswered. Um, I did include in the chat uh, to everyone, our website, the CKF website, our contact, um, our webinar sponsor, Hearts for Russ, as well as Jen Lentini's contact. If any of our panelists have um, other resources that they would like to include in the chat, we encourage you to do so. Um, now, I think um, if we could show, in closing, if we could show Jen's video, um, uh, that would be great. Oh, so I want a picture of that. Okay. That's probably Robbie. There's he wanted to say hi to you. Oh my goodness. Wait, let me get a picture of that. <laughs> Hey, you want to you want to take one from over here? Oh wow! Savannah, what do you think? Good, yeah. How are you? It's my boy. The house. <laughs> you know. Huh? Yeah, we're here with him. Every day yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. We just we went out. We had some food, and then we went to <laughs> go see if the alligators were out. And, now we're here with uh, Beth from... Uh... All right. Well, I'm certainly not crying. <laughs> that 
that's a good way to close it out. Oh my gosh. Well, um, thank you, Jen, for sharing that very moving video. Um, and again, uh, thank you all for joining us today on our uh, heart transplant webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions that were not addressed or answered in today's webinar, please do not hesitate to contact us at info at chrisklugfoundation.org or Jen. Uh, she has her uh, email in the chat. We've included all this information in the chat. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Chris Kluge Foundation or any other organizations that were mentioned today, we've um, included all of those links uh, as well in the chat. And um, with that said, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and thank you again for joining us.